have uh, a whole row of activities for you, which reminds me of the conversation that the devil has with Constantine in a movie. <laughs> when once he dies. Uh, spoiler again. Um, okay, we're going to have. Um, uh, so we have. We're going to have three different, different talks. The ones I announced. Uh, we'll have a few announcements at the end of the third talk, and then everything else is going to happen outside. And so when, once we finish the three talks, I'll give you a glimpse of uh, what's going on. Anna, Anita, Belinia, there. Uh, <laughs> she's going to to tell you about what's going to happen afterwards, and uh, a little surprise that we have for you regarding uh, the tickets that every one of you is holding. Uh, the gift is sponsored by someone. We're going to tell you about that. So our first speaker of the evening is on Jonathan Gossel. So he did his graduate work at the State University of New York and wrote his PhD thesis under David Wilson. He uh, wrote a couple of books I love a lot, the first of, uh, one of which is A Rip of Troy, where using evolutionary psychology, he tries to explain uh, what the motifs of characters were, were in the Iliad, which we know how many verses it has. Uh, <laughs> good memories. And, um, and also, most recently, the, the book I read, which made this whole event happen, the storytelling end, which basically tells us why we use stories and why stories make, uh, make us who we are. So, please welcome Jonathan Gosnell. Uh, thank you, Pedro, and uh, thank you for having me here. This is a wonderful highlight of my career to be here. There are a lot of people here. I'm also a little bit scared. Um, you're not alone. Um, this seems like a good way to start. Once upon a time, a man walks into a bar. And he sees his best friend sitting there at a table. And his friend is staring down at the tabletop where he sees this little man playing a little piano very beautifully. So the hero of our story, uh, we'll say his name is Fred. Fred walks up to his friend and he says, Wow, that man, he's so small and he's so good at playing piano. Where did you get him? And his friend doesn't even look up from the tabletop. He gives this sort of distracted wave like this. And he says, well, there's a genie out in the alley. He's giving away wishes. So Fred is interested. He runs to the back of the bar. He throws open the door to the alleyway, looks around, and sure enough, there's this huge, splendid genie standing there in the alleyway. And Fred works up his courage. And he asks the genie, he says, genie, Please grant my wish. I'd like a million bucks. The genie kind of looks in for a moment, then he nods his head, and there's this massive explosion of light in the alleyway. And when Fred can open his eyes again, the whole alleyway is full of the stench and the clamor of a million quacking ducks. Ducks, not bucks. <laughs> and they're everywhere. I mean, there's a million of them, so he's neck deep in duck. <laughs> they're flapping their wings in his face, they're, they're pecking at his knees. He has to escape. He manages to get the door to the bar open again to flee inside with this whole flock of ducks whacking at his heels. And as he's kind of running through the bar to get away, he yells to his friend. He says, can you believe that stupid genie? I asked him for a million bucks and he gave me a million ducks. And his friend finally looks up from the table and he's got this single tear rolling down his face. He says, yeah. Do you really think I asked the genie for a pianist that was 12 inches long? <laughs> so, uh, jokes are stories. You know, when we tell each other jokes, we're telling each other small, funny stories. When you go see a stand-up comedian, you're going to see a virtuoso oral story performer. And I think jokes are this great example of the way that story infiltrates just about everything people do, but in ways that we're hardly aware of. That's sort of the, the main argument of the book. The book gets in on this old, old debate, and the debate is very simple. It's what is a human being? What is it? What is it that most sets our species apart from the rest of creation? So when we call our species Homo sapiens, we're making an argument. And the argument is that it's human sapiens, human wisdom, human intelligence, human big brains that most sets our species apart. But other scientists and philosophers disagree. They say, well, we're not really all that rational and reasonable. Really, it's upright posture that sets us apart, or it's our opposable thumbs that allow us to do like really sophisticated tool use, or it's 
the complexity of culture, or it's the complexity of language. And all those things are, are really important. Um, and I'm not here to argue against any of them. I'm saying that one thing has typically been off, off, left off the list, that's kind of a people stature. That's the way that we live our lives inside the stories. So, homo sapien, yeah, that's a pretty good definition. But homo fictus, fiction man, story man, that's about equally accurate. Man is the great ape with the storytelling mind. That's the big argument in the book. Let me give you a little bit of a sense for what I mean by that. So it's the 1940s. There's two psychologists named Heider and Simmel. And they create this really simple, short, animated film. And they show it to 120 research subjects. And at the end of the film, they ask them to watch it. At the end of the film, they just ask them, hey, tell us what you saw. So what we can do right now is we can watch this footage, the actual film from the 40s. It takes about 80 seconds, maybe. And at the end, I'm going to ask you guys what you saw, and you guys can just respond through a show of hands. So what we're going to do is try to replicate, right now, this famous Hyder simul simulation. All right, let's see if we can make this work. There's no, there's no uh, audio, uh, so just watch the film. At the end, I'm going to ask you what you saw. Okay, so I'm going to ask a bunch of questions now. You guys can respond to a show of hands. First question is the most basic, simple. Who watches this and sees a story? Can you raise your hand if you do. I'm actually going to give a kind of rough count. All right, so it's a, you guys can look around the room. You see there's an overwhelming majority of positive responses. Usually a few people don't see it, too, but close to unanimity. All right, and as I ask each question, I get more and more specific. Hands will keep uh, coming down. So, who sees a story where the triangle, big triangle, is the bad guy? Okay, again, pretty close to everybody. Who sees a, a story with, uh, let's see about this question. Who sees a story, oh, this is, this is very basic. Who sees a story with this sex ratio? No, a better question first. Who sees a story where you, first of all, you, you personify the geometric shapes. So you see these geometric shapes, the triangle, the circle, that's basically human. Who, who, who sees these kind of humans? Okay, so again, some hands are coming down, but still a majority. Who sees a, a sex ratio of two males and one female? So the two triangles are male, the circle is female. Now we're getting down to maybe less than half. Okay? Who, who sees a story of this specific type? This was the most common response to the hypersimal simulation, the original experiment. Basically, you see you know, kind of sort of a love story. The little triangle, the little circle, are uh, lovers trying to live happily ever after. The big triangle is trying to split them up. But thank goodness it ends happily, and the big triangle has a tantrum and, throws, and breaks its house apart. Who sees, who sees kind of that? Okay. Now again, we're getting down to maybe about a, about a fourth of people. Um, that means that about 75% of people, or 70% of people, saw a completely different story. I'm wondering if we can have somebody uh, volunteer a story real quick. Somebody saw a different story. What was the story you saw? Somebody up close to me. Very good. And so she said she saw children playing, the two small, and who was the big friend in your story? The teacher, the authority figure, the mom. Yeah, that, that's a very common response, too. You see it as, as children squabbling or something, the mother's trying to get control of things. Um, very common. 
Okay? So what we've done is we've successfully replicated the experiment. In the original, 120 people watch the film. Only three people give a truly reasonable, rational, homo sapiens type response. What did I see? I saw triangles and circles moving around on black. <laughs> that, that's all I saw. Everyone else sees a story. They see little soap operas, little epics, little comedies, little tragedies. So this is interesting for a whole host of reasons, not least of which is that you guys enjoy it. I've always loved running this simulation because I look out at the crowd and as silly and as simple and as crude and as raw as this little, as, as this little animation is, faces are lighting up, people are smiling, people are laughing, people like stories that much. Um, one thing it shows us though is it shows us what natural story interpreters we are, what natural story creators we are. It's not just that we're capable of taking that simple simulation, those crude cues, and weaving them together into this rich and confident story. It's that most of us have an inability not to do it. We just can't help it. We do it automatically, spontaneously, effortlessly. And note that it's important that we're all seeing kind of different stories. If we were all seeing the same story, if we were all seeing that love story, it would just mean that we were very good interpreters of the story that Heider and Simmel were giving to us. That's not what's happening here. You guys aren't so much experiencing fiction during that simulation. You're creating the fiction. And again, you're doing it effortlessly, spontaneously, on the fly, and, you know, with, without consent. Your brain just does it. So I'm here to challenge a bias that a lot of people have. And the bias is that story belongs exclusively to the cultural realm. Story belongs to the humanities, story is outside nature, beyond the power of science. And there's some truth in this, right? Story emerges from culture, story is shaped by culture, but it's really a half-truth. Story is also natural for humans. This is natural for us as upright posture or our opposable thumbs, and it's been just as crucial to the success of the species. A bit of evidence for this, for the naturalness of stories. The most obvious thing is the universality of stories across cultures, across centuries. So wherever you travel in the world, and whenever you travel there, we have references to the Odyssey and the Iliad 3,000 years ago, a massively different type of barbarian civilization. But if you go there, if you got in your time machine, you travel back there, you find the same astonishing thing. No matter how difficult people work on us, no matter how pressed and difficult their lives are, they tell stories. And their stories are essentially just like ours. The same basic thematic preoccupations, the same basic plot structures. Other good evidence for the naturalness of story comes from little children who play at make-believe by instinct. It's as natural for them as breathing or dreaming. We don't have to tutor them to do it. We don't have to teach them to do it. We don't have to bribe them to do it, like to bribe them to eat broccoli or something. They just do it. So you take little kids and throw them together in a room, and you see the spontaneous creation of story art. They come up with a scenario together. They act it out. They frequently break character to give each other performance notes and to <laughs> adjust the scenario. And then, boom, back into Neverland. But kids have to grow up, so at some point, seven, eight, nine years old, depends on the kid, kids begin to leave Neverland behind. It's this kind of sad moment, dramatizing for Japan. But at least that's the conventional wisdom. I don't think it's actually true. Peter Pan refuses to leave Neverland. He refuses to grow up. He refuses to leave the land of make believe. And really, the same is true of us. We never really leave that land of fun imaginative simulation. We just change how we do it. So instead of making up our own scenarios and acting them out, we increasingly enter into scenarios created by other people. So films and novels and short stories and popular songs and so on. These are all provinces of Neverland. So we read a lot less than we used to. Nowadays, most of us are getting most of our stories through screens. 
just for the TV screen alone, the average American, if you can believe this, gets about four hours per t of TV per day. An astonishing amount. It means we're just addicted to news stories, and sports stories, and sex stories, and murder stories, and the interactive stories that are evolving in the world of video games, where you don't just watch the character passively, you are the character, you get to be the hero of the action story. And stories of reality shows, this is one of the jackasses from the show Jersey Shore. Do you guys have Jersey Shore? Uh, very sorry. Very sorry. <laughs> I apologize on behalf of my nation. Um, <laughs> and we're watching TV every now and then we get a commercial break. And, and what is that break filled with? It's mainly filled with more stories. So social scientists will conventionally define a commercial as fictive screen media. There's little 30 second short stories. Let's watch one of them now. Jack Lynch, New Jersey presents the Messing with Sasquatch. Five feet from the hole, right here. Hey, big fella. The cold one? Yeah, that's it. Oh, well, you okay? It's fine. <laughs> Stone, 
or in song, or in paint, or in movement. And story is the uh, fabric of human social life. What human social interaction largely consists of the trading of stories. We get together with a friend over coffee, beer, and we bottle these stories back and forth over our cups. And by the way, about two thirds of those stories, when, when, when psychologists listen in, are stories in a particular genre of storytelling. They're, they're gossip tales. <laughs> two thirds of a human conversation in a cafe setting, whatever. So, uh, the story is ubiquitous, story is powerful. Let's pivot a little bit and ask why. We're going to watch another video clip to help us uh, establish this. But, but in order to, to help us really feel this, I want you to imagine that it's 1896 and that you live in Paris. And that you're walking down the street and you're going to see something that you've heard about, but you've never actually witnessed for yourself. And you walk out of these hot, you know, bright streets into this cool, dark theater, one much like this. And you're sitting in a chair, much like the one you're sitting in. You're looking at a blank screen, much, much like you're looking at uh, now. And at some point, the screen erupts in light, and it's as though this window has been torn open on an alternative universe. Where you are is at one of the very first public film screens in the history of the world. And what you see on the screen terrifies you. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to watch this film now. This is the actual footage. But I want you to brace yourself because arguably this is the world's first horror film. Okay, ready? Here we go. Take one second to queue up here. This is the Lumiere Brothers. And you can slide them into an fMRI machine. 
that can watch the brain as the brain watches the film, that can read the brain as the brain reads the story. And they find something pretty interesting. That the brain doesn't look so much like a, spe a spectator on the action, it looks more like a participant in the action. So if Clint Eastwood is up on the screen and he looks really mad, your brain looks mad too. When the scene is sad, the brain looks sad as well. It does not look like your brain is sitting back, passively, coolly, watching someone else get angry or sad. It looks like it is, also, it is actually angry or sad. And you can see this happening in the paranormal activity clip, right? These people are treating fake things as though they are real. They're screaming for help. They're doing little dances in their seats to avoid blows. I like it when they pull in their knees and their elbows, falling up to protect their vital organs. <laughs> They're doing all the things they would do if their lives were actually in danger, if they were actually under attack. So part of the reason that story is so powerful for us is because at a, at a brain level, what's happening up on the on the stage or on the page is happening to us, it's happening to our brains, not just to them. We know it's fake. We know for a certainty that it's fake. But it doesn't stop unconscious parts of the brain from processing what we're seeing as real. So this is a, a pretty good place for me to break off. But before I do, I want to leave you with a couple of my favorite images of the storytelling animal in action. This picture is from 1947 and it's called The Storyteller. These are Kung San Bushman. And the storyteller is there at the center of the screen. He's got his hands up like he's a wizard or like he's a conductor. And he brought his people together, skin up against skin, mind up against mind. And he's controlling all the thoughts in their heads, all the feelings in their hearts. He's wielding enormous power. And he's doing so only with like the most basic human tools, right? His, his, his face, his expressions, his voice, his story. And I don't have anything brilliant or scientific to say about this, except that I just think it's quite wonderful that this is the kind of animal that we were. And it's the kind of animal that we still are. An animal that helplessly needs stories in the best times, in the worst times. So these are storytelling animals in London during the Blitz. And they're living in this time of real fear, real privation, real danger. And yet here they are, picking through the bombed out remains of this library in search of some solace from stories. So that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Questions. Um, so we, we wanted to keep this relatively informal. So instead of having like a huge Q and A afterwards when everyone is half asleep, we wanted to have a few questions after each speaker, and then everyone is encouraged to interact with the speakers outside after the, um, the three talks, okay? So, we have time for a couple of questions if anyone wants to. There are a couple of mics traveling around. No questions, anyone? What's your purpose? Oh, over there. Over there on the top. Yeah. One brave soul <laughs> among a bunch of chickens. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm just a curious chicken. <laughs> now, I would, like, uh, I would like to ask you about... Uh, okay, so we are homo fictions, which is amazing. Uh, the ability for every one of us to create a story from uh, the most simple arrangement of uh, uh, minimal forms, minimal shapes in this case. Um, my curiosity is, and my question goes to, um, when we all think about, we see the same thing, and uh, after seeing a lot of the same things throughout our lives, we tend to think alike, right? Or no, I don't know, I mean, this is my question to you. Yeah, go on. 
And um, I would like to pose the question of um, the role of politics and the way we, we are fine-tuned, or might be fine-tuned, by our culture to think in, in a particular way. So Martin does this all the time. So we consume some certain things. And uh, I would like to know if you have more information about that. Uh, not much. Uh, Plato, Plato says that man is a political animal. I claim that man is a storytelling animal. Uh, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not very good on the, the, the political stuff. I do think that you know, politicians, for instance, are very good. At, they, they know they're in a story war. You know, the American presidential election just happened. And you have basically each candidate has an enormous storytelling factory where they're churning out information, spinning narratives, uh, usually sort of hero narratives on their side, villain narratives um, on the other side. And I, and I do think, uh, you know, sort of, the other part of your question, or sort of fundamental part of your question was, um, is the way that we're constantly marinating ourselves, oftentimes in the same stories, so we all see Star Wars, we all see, uh, a lot of us read Harry Potter, a lot of us have read the same sort of foundational folk tales and myths and, and fairy tales and, and national creation myths and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, what, what sort of influence does that have? I, I think that there's something to that, that, you know, that uh, we're, we're constantly sort of marinating in the same sort of norms, the same sort of values. I, I think it can make a sort of a society work better. Uh, the, the fact that we all consume the same sorts of stories. Uh, other questions, or? Um, about folk tales, one of the interesting things that is happening, I'm not sure, sure if in Portugal that is happening, but I live in England, and we are starting to see a sanitized cleaning of the folk stories. So you have the wolf, you have the little redwood, and suddenly this is all about pedophilia and about young men and sexualized. What do you think about that? Does it make any sense at all? Why are we destroying this? What do you think about this in your movement? Uh, the movement sort of read a deep, deep and sinister significance into the folk, folk tales, fairy yeah. tales, and make them kind of evil things or something like this. Yeah. Uh, it's not a new movement. It's been around the States for a long, long time, so several, several decades. Um, I think it's, I kind of share your assessment that, it's, that there's a lot of silliness uh, involved in it. One of the things that's silly about uh, fairy tales and folk tales, in my opinion, is the way that over time we've kind of got prissy about them. Uh, in the original tales, if you go back to the Grimm Brothers and those kinds of things, they're really dark, violent, bloody uh, sorts of tales, and a lot of that information has been stripped out. Uh, so we're going to protect our, our children uh, from these things. We kind of sanitize them, we level them out, uh, we hide a lot of the blood and gore. Uh, but there's still, like, you take the Cinderella story, it's still a terrifying story. So they, so they get rid of the blood and gore, the sisters are getting their feet chopped off, crows coming to peck out the evil stepsisters and eyes. But it's still a story about a little girl who loses her protectors and her providers and comes under the power of people who despise her. It's still a very, very scary story. And kids are attracted to it. Stories are about trouble. Stories are always about trouble. They're always about problems. The naughtier the trouble, the naughtier the problem, the naughtier the difficulty, the, the more we're attracted to it, the more, the more we like it. And so uh, I, think, I think children can handle these, 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 these fairy tales um, in, uh, in, in pretty strong forms. So you see all the evil that these early stories had uh, they didn't have to do with the time space because children like problems. I think, I think, just to give you a personal anecdote from my life, uh, we have a daughter named Annabelle. And Annabelle, and I got a, an anthology of world full of fairy tales. I started reading them to her, and at some point I got freaked out a little bit because they were so nasty. All kinds of cannibalism and ghosts and monsters. And I was just, I'm, I thought it was going to give her nightmares. And so I asked what happened. Should we stop? Should we stop reading this? You, uh, this, is, this is too scary. She's like, she's like no. The story's about death. The uh, story's about death. I'm like, it's all a death in this. She's like, she's like, no, don't stop. I love death. <laughs> she, was, she was six. But here's what she meant by it, I think. I think she was saying, you, 
I'm fascinated by that. I know there's something big and important out there waiting for all of us. And you guys are systematically hiding it from me. You know, I want to know about this. I'm curious about this. I'm ready to learn about it. And, and, that's, and, and folk fairy tales have sort of always served that function, right? Of introducing especially young children into the realities of life and the realities of, of, of life inside a culture. Can I, can I just uh, add something? Uh, <laughs> it's my friend said. Yeah, there are people who want to also maybe ask questions. I don't know if it's. Uh, we have time for one more question. I'll see if anyone is really, really, really interested in asking one. No? Yes? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the the example that you gave, uh, the experience with the, the triangles and circles, um, do you think maybe the, the time that people invest uh, in reading books or stories or uh, I don't know, watching series and movies, etc., do you think that time invested would affect the, the complexity of the stories that people see on that uh, show? Sure. So, like, like you had a person, if you had uh, some of the research subjects who were like heavy story consumers, and some maybe didn't read a lot of stories or watch a lot of stories, would there be a difference in the sophistication of the narratives? Yeah, possibly. Uh, and my guess is that work has actually been done. I don't know it, but I guess it's been done. Uh, this, this, this has been replicated in all kinds of ways over the last 50 years. So my guess is that people have uh, probably tried something like that, but I don't know the result. So you do have, but you do find there's always a few people in the room who don't uh, see a story. Um, again, the original three people who didn't see a story. So possibly, I mean, don't read too much into it if, uh, if you didn't see a story. But one of the you know, there are there are people who are challenged when it comes to creating narrative. Uh, so for, with, with autism and children, for instance, one of the three prime criteria <coughs> for diagnosing autism in little children is whether or not they spontaneously pretend, and whether or not they're interested in stories. And if they're not, it would be kind of a, a giveaway that the person um, is uh, possibly somewhere on the autism spectrum. So uh, on one side, you have people who are sort of the story impoverished lives, people with autism on the far, far end. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who have sort of a wild, almost story madness, this sort of crazed overproduction of narratives be sort of uh, the, the most extreme version of it would be versions of bipolar disorder or versions of uh, schizophrenia, where people lose control of their storytelling faculty and they create wild narratives and they lose the line between uh, pretend and real. Um, now, it, one, one of the things that's kind of interesting is people who are on that spectrum but a little bit over towards the schizophrenia bipolar side, those people are highly overrepresented as creative artists, especially as writers and poets and filmmakers and that kind of thing. So if you watch it, if you read a, a book like Moby Dick, uh, Moby Dick is um, you know, one of the great American novels, and it's also just frankly a crazy book. It's a wild, loony, loony in its creativity. Um, and it's partially probably due to the fact that Mel I mean, Melville was a, was a little bit crazy as he's uh, writing the book, you know? Uh, and he struggled with mental illness his whole life and was a very miserable person for large chunks of it. But if not for that, he might not have had 